Welcome to part 12 of my series examining Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. Uh, we are going to launch into a discussion of Ernst Haeckel and embryology. Now, a whole bunch of this material is exactly what I covered in my um, video response to when Russ Miller appeared on Carl Baugh's TV show. Um, and I, I, I hate repeating myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link down below to those episodes. Um, I am going to, there, there'll be a few repeats here. Um, I'm going to try to keep it down to a minimum and I'm going to try to, I'm going to, essentially I'm going to gloss over this with just a few commentaries. Okay. It, I mean, I, I apologize for that, but I don't want to go through this whole, the whole history of what actually happened with Haeckel. I'll also put a link uh, down below to uh, some really good articles on the whole Haeckel incident, what actually happened and the origin of the story as presented by creationists and um, how it differs from, from reality. Okay. Ernst Haeckel read Darwin's book a year after it came out. He said it was the turning point in his thinking starting in 1860. As I've stated before, Ernst Haeckel is known, is actually known to have first read Origin of Species in 1864, five years after its publication, not the year after its publication. And yes, he said it was a very important book, but again, I want to stress that never in Haeckel's career was he a Darwinist, okay? He believed in evolution. He believed in it. He did not believe in a mechanism of solely natural selection being responsible for evolutionary change. He believed in a type of essentially neo-Lamarckism that he called recapitulation. And it's very, very different from Darwinism, even if there's some overlap. Well, he had the same problem that Darwinists have today. Ten years later, he still had no evidence to support Darwinism. So he did what evolutionists have been famous for ever since. He made up some proof. Evolutionists make up data. Is that kind of like, um, I don't know, taking a scientific paper and then telling an audience that it has words in it that it doesn't actually contain that, that sound like the papers proving evolution false? Um, is, is that what you would call fabricating data? What about taking quotes and removing keywords like not that change the entire meaning of the sentence and then saying this famous evolutionist said, um, is, that, is that what you would call um, making up data? Uh, I'm just curious. What, 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 do you, what, what do you consider making up data? Is claiming that a paper on a comparison of human and chimp DNA uh, and then making the claim that this has widened the gap when it actually the paper has narrowed the gap completely mean, the opposite meaning of what the paper intended to say? Is that what you call inventing data? I'm curious there, Russ. I'm going to show you a picture that shows his drawings of a human and some various creatures in the embryonic stage going from left to right across the top. Right below them will be the actual photos. You'll see that his drawings going left to right across the top look very similar. The photos do not look like his drawings. As I went through in detail in my earlier videos, not, not in this series, in my other series, um, the, the pictures of the embryos that, that Miller is showing here are not the embryos that he was considered to have faked, okay? Those embryos are completely different. They're not nearly as interesting. They're, don't, they're, not, they're not reprinted or used today. So therefore, they don't in any way support Miller's case. Instead, he uses Haeckel's more or less legitimate embryos. Um, but one thing um, that I want you to notice, look at the figures down below. Um, those are from Richardson. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall which, which year the publication was. Um, it will be in down below. But the embryos down below are from a paper where Richardson was trying to show that Haeckel's embryos were inaccurate, not frauds, that they just weren't very accurately drawn. However, Richardson was called out in a way because of the fact that one thing you'll notice about the embryos, the photographs of the embryos, is that they're twisted, they're not all in the same position, um, they're lying at different angles, and several of them have their yolk sacs attached, which in Haeckel's drawings, it states specifically the yolk sacs have been removed and drawings have been scaled to the same size. Um, so think about it. Look at the drawings that Richardson provides and think, if you were to take that embryo and, say, straighten it out into the same position as the one next to it and then remove the yolk sac, would they look alike or would they not look alike? Okay, think about that. That's kind of an important um, aspect of, the, of this. So this is, for, this is distortion in the other direction, in my opinion. 
that Haeckel took a human embryo and just copied it and called it a dog and a salamander and such is simply false. Um, it's not true. Again, link down below to a article that covers the entire history of this thing of this of Haeckel um, and what actually happened, and that's not true. What he had done was he took a human in the embryonic stage and made copies of it and labeled them fish and salamanders and turtles and chickens, etc. And he came up with the biogenetic law. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Uh, yeah, how's a kid supposed to argue with that, right? Absolutely. Well, a kid who would have to argue with that would have to be a kid who's oh, attending a biology lecture in, say, the uh, first decade of the 20th century, maybe. Um, certainly not after that fact. Uh, this is what's going on here. Now, I've had a couple of PM exchanges with him, with Russ Miller, um, and a comment exchange on another video, which is linked down below, uh, where he completely misunderstands the science of embryology. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to get into this here in a little bit more detail in a bit. Um, Russ Miller doesn't seem to understand that Haeckel's theory of recapitulation, okay, is a theory based on the evidence of embryonic similarity, embryonic homologies, okay? Recapitulation is incorrect. However, other theories based on embryonic similarities and homologies are correct, that, if that makes sense. What, what Miller is, look, is missing is that every single time he sees embryos lined up in any fashion, whether they be Haeckel's drawings or whether they be photographs or whether they be anything, he's saying, look, here's recapitulation being taught. That's simply a misunderstanding on your part, Russ. Okay, You don't understand the difference. Um, you went through this through me a, with me a number of times and you never got it. All you were capable of doing with it is you. whenever I would say, well, the embryos do look like each other, you'd say, ha, you believe in recapitulation because you're not understanding enough to separate the two concepts. This was proven fraud in the 1870s. Still taught in college today. Again, and this is due to Russ Miller's complete lack of understanding of embryogenesis or embryology in general, okay? Take, take an undergraduate level. How about that, Russ? Take an undergraduate level development class. I, I challenge you to just take a class and then you'll say, Oh, I see. That's why what they're saying isn't Haeckel revisited. In embryology, and there are some, some very fine embryologists, but I'm sure they're, they're ashamed of a lot of the frauds that have taken place under their name of, in their field of science. But in the initial stages of development, vertebra embryos are radically different. You need to realize Darwinists claim that they should be very similar. Animal embryos first undergo cleavage where the fertilized egg divides into thousands of cells. Each major group of animals, mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles, follow very different and very distinctive cleavage patterns. This proves they did not evolve from a common ancestor. First of all, fish, amphibians, birds, mammals, reptiles are not major groups of animals. They're actually major groups of vertebrates. I'm an invertebrate zoologist, and those groups do not in any way represent a wide diversity of animal types. All right, you want diversity um, of embryos, diversity of cleavage patterns. Look at look at a uh, sponge compared to a polychaete worm compared to a sea star. Then you'll see some diversity of cleavage patterns. Um, but the one the thing I want to bring up is why are you showing pictures of the Ferengula stage when you're talking about cleavage? What's important to note here is that. He says each of the major groups have radically different cleavage patterns. Actually, he means that they ha there's two different types of cleavage patterns found in vertebrates. Not all of them with their own type. There's two major kinds. Miroblastic, it's actually called discoidal miroblastic cleavage, and holoblastic cleavage. And I'm going to explain, hopefully briefly, what those mean. In vertebrates that have a yolk, okay, the single cell divides divides into two, just like normal, um, divides into two, one of the cells continues to divide and grows into the embryo, right? The second cell divides several more times 
but doesn't form an embryo. It forms a disc. Think of it as an interface between the embryo and the yolk, right? Think about that. So the the of the first two cells that split, one cell will grow into the embryo. The second cell will grow into this disc called a blastodisc that will then sort of it kind of think of it as almost like a rudimentary placenta. It absorbs nutrients from the yolk, transfers them to the embryo, serves a number of other functions. Okay, that's that's in myroblastic cleavage, and that's what fish, amphibians, birds, reptiles, some mammals do. In other words, anything that has a yolk-filled egg has this myroblastic cleavage. Holoblastic cleavage means the eggs divide into two cells, then those each of those two split into, to make four, and then a split again, where there's all of the cells grow into the embryo. These two cleavage patterns are actually really, really similar. Um, the only thing lacking is that holoblastic cleavage, um, the cells will never form this blastodisc. That's really the main difference, and they don't form a blastodisc because holoblastic cleavage organisms with that don't have yolk. It's really, really simple. Animal embryos then enter the gastrulation stage where their cells rearrange and generate basic tissue types and the general layout of the body. Once again, each major group of animals follows a very different and very distinct process. Once again, this goes absolutely against Darwinian teachings. Again, here when you say each major group has radically different um, stages of gastrulation, now that depends if you're talking about major groups as in major groups of animals. Are you talking about comparing sponges and worms and, and arthropods and whatever? Or are you talking about, again, vertebrates? Are you talking about tetrapods? What group are you referring to is going to affect the how accurate that statement is? Because if you're talking about the entire animal kingdom, then yes, there are a few major types of gastrulation, um, subdivisions of gastrulation that are important. But if, it's, if you are still talking about vertebrate embryos, okay, then gastrulation is gastrulation is gastrulation, okay? It's the same mechanism. There's not major divisions. The fact of the matter is, all deuterostomes have pretty much the same pattern of gastrulation. You're simply uh, making stuff up if you're trying to imply that they have these radically different mechanisms. Only after these two processes do the embryos very briefly resemble one another. Yet here's a brand new textbook still teaching ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. They say, look, kids, you have gill slits or gill pouches. You're going through your fish phase. Well, let me point something out. You never had gill slits, you never had gills, and you never had gill pouches. Those are folds in the skin that later develop into the throat uh, organs in the human. You never have gills of any sort. That's purely fraud in the textbooks. Tell me, Russ, are you aware of when you're lying, or is it really you're so full of your own bullshit you're incapable of recognizing when you're being deceitful? So you're citing from a textbook that says that human embryos have gill pouches or gill slits. Um, gill pouches is probably the term the textbook used. And you're saying, you're then say, you're, you're, you're saying that the textbook said that, and then you're saying they're claiming that humans have gills during their fish phase, which the textbook, you know that it doesn't say that, right? You know that saying that human embryos have gill pouches isn't the same as saying humans are going through their fish phase and have gills. The term gill pouches in chordates refers to a series of folds of skin found throughout chordates, through, in fact, even some of the, the chordate relatives like the hemichordates, um, that in fish develop into the gills, hence the term gill pouches. They're not gills, they're gill pouches. Um, and in tetrapods, they develop into the lower jaw, they develop into a lot of the organs and such as the throat, the larynx and, and nerves and muscles and bone of the head and face and such. Okay. The reason they're called gill pouches, again, is because it, in fish, they, they develop directly into the gills. Um, in the, I like the term pharyngeal pouches because in the non vertebrate chordates, like sea squirts, amphioxus, and these other groups, and even the hemichordates and such, um, they are pharyngea. Is what they, these folds develop into the pharyngea? Okay, so at that at that stage of development, all chordates have 
a very similar appearing larval or embryonic type that has these pharyngeal or gill pouches. Okay, nobody's saying that these embryos have gills, except well, except for you, um, and you're lying about it. 